While we're bringing up the slides, uh, I'll dedicate this talk to Luca, who's sitting in the back there, a future scholar um, in our field. He's a, a nascent scholar, as you can tell if you observe him in the back there, He's sitting next to his mom, Rachel Ankeny, who's one of our colleagues from the University of Adelaide. Let me go back to the first slide here. So um, the original talk for this was going to be so many issues, so little time. Actually, I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time about the arcana of the Myriad case. Uh, it was decided on the uh, 13th of June. Um, and while we've been meeting here, uh, the saga continues. So I'll just walk through very quickly what I think the state of play is and make a few observations. This is a slide because I give a lot of talks at continuing med medical education. We're always supposed to disclose where we get our money from. Basically, all of our sources for funding of our research are from nonprofit sources. Um, we don't take any money from any corporate sources. Um, this is uh, this is the Angelina Jolie slide here. Um, her revelation of having high risk, high inherited risk of breast and ovarian cancer came out in the New York Times in an op-ed piece that she courageously wrote um, in May, about a month before this case was decided. And the publicity relating to her revelation is actually much bigger than even the Supreme Court case got. Um, it's created a lot of interest, um, a lot of women first paying attention to this issue precisely because one of the most uh, conspicuous women on the planet has come out and said, I had both my breasts removed because I had very high risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer. Um, but the rest of the slides on this, uh, on this <coughs> page, this is Eric Lander who wrote one of the amicus briefs that was cited nine times in the oral arguments. Um, this, these two slides, the top one here and down here, these, this was a protest that was organized by Breast Cancer Action, which was an original plaintiff. Here's Jim Watson, who was there. Um, and most importantly, here's uh, Esther Van Zimmeren, who is a, a PhD in law from the University of Leuven, who was working with us at the time and got to attend the oral arguments. Another postdoc working with us. Here are two undergraduates from Duke, uh, two research assistants from Duke, and a Harvard undergraduate. And then you, here you have the luminaries of the Genome Project. This is Eric Green, who's the current director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. And looming in the background here is uh, Francis Collins and, of course, Eric again. So this was an epic moment. Uh, this was the celebratory uh, uh, meeting on the steps of the Supreme Court. This is actually the Supreme Court in the background here. Most prominent slide here is Pigs Fly. This was the headline when Judge Sweet overturned the patents in March of 2010 as the first step. That was kind of the trial court, district court level decision that was uh, that's kicked off this case. Um, it's a patent lawsuit, but it was an unusual patent lawsuit because it was not two companies fighting each other in court for who was going to get the money from the exclusive rights that grew out of the patents uh, that came from the discovery of the BRCA1 and 2 genes. Um, the suit was brought by the American Civil Liberties Union and the Public Patent Foundation because they really didn't like Myriad. Um, and they collected 20-some plaintiffs. They sued Myriad in uh, May of 2009. And the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, actually went to the Supreme Court twice, um, via the Court of Appeals twice. Um, interestingly, price was really not the central issue here. It was really about business practices and access to um, genetic testing and whether you could um, get testing from another laboratory if you wanted to and if you could get follow-up testing. Um, it was really about medical decision making the case centered on the patents because that was the line of attack. That was the thing that could be attacked, and that was the cause of the exclusive rights that allowed Myriad to basically dictate the standard of care for BRCA testing in the United States because it had established a monopoly. The Supreme Court basically decided something rather simple. They said, we aren't going to go into why, but here's our conclusion. 
all nine of us on this court think that you should be able to patent a DNA molecule if you've done something to engineer it or change it and it's not found in nature. It clearly is touched by the hand of man. But if all you've done is isolate a gene or a molecule of DNA and it has the exact same sequence that you would find in nature, you can't patent that. And that's all that they have decided. They didn't actually even go claim by claim and say this is good, that's bad. They just said, here's what we say, now figure it out. Well, we're about to figure it out because while we've been meeting here, Myriad has sued two companies. Uh, two days ago they sued Ambry Genetics, yesterday they sued gene to gene through a company, a subsidiary called DNA Traits. And we're now going to have, presumably, a series of cases, at least two, um, that are really about uh, this first question, which is, if you've discovered a gene, can you block competitors from doing PCR amplification of DNA molecules for that gene? Um, and that will be tested in the context of testing not only for BRCA1 and N2, but for the other 20 genes that are associated with inherited risk of breast and ovarian cancer. They're less commonly mutated, but there are another 20 genes that are also associated with, with inherited risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Um, the other really interesting uh, thing that happened just yesterday is Myriad has announced that it will not sue for nonprofit research or for follow-up testing once you've gotten your result back from Myriad. It's a, it's a policy that they've been urged to adopt for five years and now on the verge of suing other companies, they've adopted it. A couple things to, to notice. This doesn't cover all of the controversies. There is still the looming question of, they've done a million tests at Myriad because they've had a monopoly in the United States um, and all the data therefore have flowed to them for the United States. And they've created a very large database because they've actually done a pretty good job of keeping track of families and risks and they can interpret some genetic tests. Five to 10% of the tests will produce a res result where you can't really interpret it based on public information. They claim to be able to interpret all but about 2%, 2 to 3% of those cases that are so-called variants of unknown significance. Um, their database has, of course, been leveraged off of their patent monopoly, and it will not expire when the patents begin to expire uh, about a year from now. Um, so this is a separate issue that's linked to the intellectual property associated with patents, but it's actually intellectual property that's independent of the patents. Um, Here's just an observation about where we are in the state of play. Um, here we are two decades after the discovery of the first of these genes, BRCA1, um, and a million tests, and we still are discovering new mutations that we don't know how to interpret. These are among the most studied genes on the planet, uh, human genes on the planet, and we've still got a lot of work to do, and this is only the beginning of what's going to be happening for many other genomic tests. Um, a, a final observation um, is that the first patent case, Myriad, what would actually be Myriad 4, uh, there were three lawsuits that happened way back in the 90s. Uh, Myriad 4 was the Association of Molecular Pathology, the one that was just decided by the Supreme Court. Well, now we have Myriad 5 and Myriad 6, which are going to be AMRI and Gene to Gene, and we don't know, maybe they're suing somebody else today. Um, Maybe we'll get up to seven or eight. The original, that, that the case that was decided by the Supreme Court, though, was a public interest law case. That was the American Civil Liberties Union and Public Patent Foundation. Didn't want to make money. They wanted to change the law. Now, the current cases are actually now classic patent cases. It's myriad as a competitor suing competitor laboratories. And so far, they have only sued uh, commercial laboratories that are offering this test. Um, and it looks like it will be classic grounds. There are 10 patents that are involved so far. Um, I think some of those patents may disappear from this case because there are some complexities that we can get into in discussion. Um, but this is going to be classic uh, uh, patent law of competitor suits competitor. And it's going to be framed in a very different way by the courts, therefore. And I think it's significant that Myriad has said, hey, we're going to allow verification testing and research use because that's going to take some stuff off the table that the Supreme Court was very concerned about. Um,
This will still be on the table, however, which is when you're creating data and interpreting data that matter for both science and for clinical interpretation. Sharing data is really important, and Myriad, that's the one thing that Myriad has not pledged to do, which is share their data. So I think this will remain an issue in the case. And if you're interested in the norms of sharing and what people have said about access to data and stuff like that, here are three reports from the National Academies in the United States that address those issues.